Hi everyone. Good morning if you are on the West Coast and good morning or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, my name is Deborah Feldstein and I am the West Coast Associate Director for the Jewish Funders Network. I want to thank you all for being here today and thank all of our panelists. Um, just a few things before we get started. Um, one is um, this is a series part of a series of um, programs that JFN is doing in response to COVID-19. And these are open to both our members and the larger community of people who are interested in exploring the topics that we are presenting. If you visit our website, and I will put a link in the chat box, you will see the links to past conversations that we have had on topics ranging from Jewish day schools um, to impact in Israel and Jewish summer camps. If there are topics that we have not explored that you are interested in, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the JFN staff and we can discuss how to explore those conversations in this forum. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping things. We will publish the bios of all of our speakers today in the chat room. So if you're interested in learning more about them or their organizations, there are opportunities for you to do that there. And we also invite you to submit any questions that you have for any or all of our presenters today in the chat room, and we will address those at the end of our presentations. So thank you very much. I'm going to now turn this over to Jim Heger, who is our moderator and facilitator for today. Uh, Jim is the immediate past president of the Moisha House and the current president of the San Francisco Jewish Federation. He has served in leadership roles with Jewish organizations across the country, and we are so grateful for you being here today, Jim, and supporting this program. So thank you, and over to you. Great, thank you, Deborah, and thank you uh, to all of you for joining and to this uh, great panel that uh, that uh, Deborah has put together. We're uh, excited to share with you today a little bit about what's happening in the in the world of uh, college students and young adults as it relates to the pandemic, and uh, we're going to do that with uh, you know with these with. Uh, a, a panel of, of really um, uh, expert uh, folks who have a lot of experience in this space. Um, I, I noticed today is Lagba Omer on the Jewish calendar. Um, it is uh, it sort of marks a, a middle point, and, well, not the middle, but it, it marks a, 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 a transition in the uh, time between Passover and Shavuot. In ancient times, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, uh, an epidemic uh, that that sort of ended about this time, and this was essentially a celebration. Lagba Omer became a celebration of of coming out of a dark time. So hopefully that's a good uh, that's a good signal for uh, for what we're talking about today. And uh, we all hope that uh, that soon we will be uh, coming uh, you know around the corner of this um, of this rather dark period. So today we're going to talk about the challenges of uh, uh, young adults and college age, uh, you know, Jewish um, uh, folks. And um, we're going to talk about the uniqueness of this 18 to 30 ish group. Um, we're going to hear about sort of what is different about, um, you know, this generation. Um, this is now sort of Gen, Gen Z, uh, uh, you know, millennial crossover. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening with, with this group. Um, and, and we're going to try and put this in the context of, of uh, how uh, philanthropists are, can and are addressing these needs. So hopefully our panelists will share with us some of their thoughts on, on what they're seeing um, in terms of, of, uh, of working with, with philanthropists that support them. And we'll, we'll talk about um, what, the, what, what additional needs are out there still. Um, and, and I think we're also going to try and take an opportunity to talk about are there opportunities that are popping out of sort of this um, otherwise uh, uh, potentially bleak picture. So, you know, with, with, with any, uh, you know, I guess with Churchill, it's a don't waste a good crisis. So, you know, the opportunities here to learn and to adapt, uh, you know, our programming across the, a variety of different um, uh, of different uh, 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 sectors, I, I think will come out as we talk through this. 
I just want to put a little bit of context around uh, philanthropy as it relates to uh, the pandemic response um, in general, and then uh, then we'll we'll uh, I'll turn it over to the to the panelists to um, to share their thoughts. Um, I, I think the first thing you know from the standpoint of, of sort of a big picture on philanthropy, the um, I think about this as in sort of multiple waves. You know, when we when this first hit a few weeks ago, the first wave was really uh, that of of trying to address the human, you know, the most human basic humanitarian needs. Um, as as it progresses, as the situation has progressed, I think we're increasingly looking at the Jewish ecosystem and what are the what are the challenges that the that the ecosystem is going to have in trying to bounce back. And and more and more organizations are looking at sort of what the situation. Uh, is with their particular organization and how they fit into, you know, their uh, either their community or their you know place in sort of the national picture. Um, look, there are extraordinary needs. Nobody, that's that's not a big surprise. There are extraordinary needs here. Um, but one of the things that I I, I was on a I was on a uh, study session with Yehuda Kurtzer from the from the Hartman Institute uh, last week, and he was talking about the fact that you know some of the challenges that we're facing in the pandemic are really things that have been there for quite a while, and this the pandemic is merely accelerating those challenges. Um, so so uh, you know, but I think that works both ways. It, it, there are also opportunities here that that uh, the pandemic may serve as accelerants. So I hope we can uh, explore a little bit of that with our our panelists. Um, there there's um, I think I think another aspect of philanthropy is is sort of the unprecedented cooperation between funders. Um, the uh, JFNA, the Jewish Federations of North America, you know, uh, worked with. Um, a number of the really large funders, including the Jim Joseph Foundation, Schusterman, Maimonides, um, to put together uh, what is this uh, loan, uh, it, it's a combined loan and grant pool uh, that is that has recently launched. Um, that, that's something that just hasn't happened uh, in the, you know, in the Jewish world in the past. So I, I think the one of the things that we're seeing here is, is cooperation that we haven't um, seen across uh, the philanthropy sector before. You know, another factor here is the use of government support. Clearly, um, you know, many, many of these organizations have, you know, turned to the, those that are eligible, turned to small business uh, loans and, and uh, you know, are using, uh, you know, are, are reaching out for government support where it makes sense. Um, so we are going to hear from the, the panelists now. Um, we're going to talk about um, the needs uh, that they see now, what do they see down the road, um, what are some of the opportunities. Um, and I, we put together a great panel. Um, I'm going to just uh, mention them because I think we're going to put the links to their um, to their uh, bios up on the screen so you can look at those uh, uh, in parallel. Um, Mimi Kravitz is the Chief Experience Officer of Hillel International. Uh, Daniel Krauss is the Associate Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for the Birthright Israel Foundation. David Siegelman is the founder and chief executive officer of Moisha House, and Rebecca Barr is the executive director of uh, Hala for Hunger. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to each of them for a few minutes uh, to, to sort of lay out how they see it, and then we'll, uh, I'll, we'll come back and I'll ask some questions, and then we'll open it up uh, towards the end for, um, for you to ask some questions if you have them. So with that, let me turn it over to Mimi, and uh, I'll let her kick it off. Great. Thanks, Jim. And uh, good to have the opportunity to speak to all of you from home, wherever you are in the world during this very um, crazy time. And uh, I, I'm really proud to be able to talk to you today a little bit about what's going on with Jewish college students and the ways in which the Hillel movement and every local Hillel is still working to serve them and engage them at this time. Before I even start talking through things, I think the most important thing to know is that college students' needs right now are greater than ever because of everything they're encountering with the shift to the pandemic um, environment and to lockdowns and cancellations and changes in their lives and schedules. And that Hillel, among many other organizations, um, have been really creative and innovative in figuring out how to serve students in this time and are very much open for business. Um, I'm going to see if I can uh, share a presentation. 
Um, and let me see if I can pull you guys back up now and still see you. Um, for my fellow panelists, can you see the presentation that I'm sharing right now? Yes, yes. Because you're the only ones I can see the nod. Okay. Um, so I'll try and go through in a few minutes what's going on with Hillel. And when I speak about Hillel, I speak about the Hillel movement, which is a movement of uh, about um, serving about 550 campuses in North America, the US and Canada, and about 56 campuses abroad all over the world, including in Latin America, including in Eastern Europe. Um, and the Hillel movement is very busy right now and doing some of what we've always been doing. So Hillel's commitment has always been to empower Jewish students to self-author meaningful Jewish lives, something that's even more important right now as students are, are moving home and figuring out who they are and what they need in the midst of this global pandemic. And the actions we're taking right now are to do the things that we have really always been doing to create comfort and support of warm and pluralistic Jewish communities, to help people find purpose drawn from Jewish wisdom, to connect students individually to each other and to help them thrive as individuals and emerging adults, and to give them a platform through which to enrich the world. And very much all the ways in which we're seeing the trends go in the pandemic and the experience of students and the ways we're responding are in line with the work that we've always been doing. Um, and so I'm gonna talk first about some challenges that have happened over the last two or three months and the ways in which Hillel is responding. And then I'll speak a little bit to what we're expecting um, in the future, as well as um, some of the bright spots we're seeing. And there's actually a lot of them. As Jim said, there's a lot of just really um, powerful creativity, innovation, partnership happening in this moment. But first about the challenges over the last couple of months. The first one is you're probably not surprised, um, is that with students dispersed, there's an increase in isolation, loneliness, and sadness. In a recent Active Mind survey of college students, one in five students have said that this situation has affected their mental health, and about 86% of students feel in some ways stress, anxiety, loneliness. That's probably not surprising because all of us are experiencing that in any age. Um, and the immediate way in which Hillel and many Jewish organizations are responding has been with online programming, but with students becoming what we're calling zoomed out, sick of looking at screens, also through other kinds of virtual engagement, picking up the phone, texting, um, and connecting people with each other. Um, and we've been providing a national platform called Hillel at Home, which really high level speakers and educators to engage students. Another trend to fly through them quickly, because there's so many amazing speakers today, is around the stress of students losing internship opportunities and job opportunities and summer camp opportunities. And so we've been working to create virtual internships and help partners create virtual internships and connect students with those opportunities for this summer and are looking to do that for job opportunities for seniors next year as well, using the, net, the power of the Hillel network nationally and internationally. We're also seeing that a lot of students, not surprisingly, want to make a difference in the face of this global pandemic. There's a real trend in interest in service, um, which we know is something that Gen Z was already interested in and is even more so in this time. And so local Hillels have really been developing a lot of service initiatives, depending on where they are regionally, to make sure that people can either reach out in their communities in ways that are safe um, amidst social distancing or creating virtual ways for them to engage with each other and people in need. Um, and from a Hello International perspective, our umbrella organization, which supports about 200 staffed local Hillels um, providing support for those campuses, we've also been looking at the ways in which the financial crisis of this moment is really affecting local Hillels, both currently and the ways they're expecting it to impact them next year. And so we've been providing guidance on SBA loan support, increased grants, so that we can continue to invest in talent and investment that we've made significantly over the last five years um, in the local staff at individual Hillel's who make such a uh, difference for um, students to make sure that they can preserve some level of staffing because it's those individual relationships that matter um, and supporting local Hillel's and continuing their fundraising efforts and providing them support to realize that they can fundraise locally. Last year, we ran Hillel Global Giving Week 
um, in line um, with the national campaign. Um, and we, the local Hillel's raised about $1.9 million that we were able to help match through Hillel International to expand their impact. And what we've heard is that that was important, not only because of the match, but really because of the way in which it inspired so many of our partners and stakeholders and funders to realize that local Hillel's are still open and that they can continue to give and the power of what nonprofits are doing. We're, we're doing a lot of work now, scenario planning for what the future might look like. And when I think of what all of you as partners and funders and stakeholders can do, it's really looking towards the uncertain future, making sure to continue to support Hillel and all of the organizations that you care deeply about as all of us are in this phase of scenario planning and making sure that we're ready for whatever comes next. Um, there's gonna be a potential delay in students returning to campus virtual semesters and students who are going to be home in their local communities instead of in their residential college campuses. And so we're doing scenario planning to make sure that we're able to continue to engage and support students as they do not return back to campus or as they return back to campuses with very, very different environments. Um, there's going to continue to be an increased need for mental health and wellness support and a real need to give in that direction in whatever way makes sense. We likely will see fewer travel and in-person conferences, um, certainly in the fall, but maybe for some portion of the whole year. And so we're moving towards ways to have virtual gatherings beyond Zoom. And um, we do expect that both for the, our, our central office and for our whole field, uh, people are expecting that there's potentially a reduction in philanthropy and then, and therefore for those who really can give, the giving becomes even more important. Um, and so one of our roles is as a funder of local Hillel's and we are trying to make sure that we continue to be there for them, that we're flexible in the giving of our resources and that we're giving it to the programs and the initiatives and the operational needs that are highest priority for them. Um, I'll just say one more thing and then pass, which is this has been a time of great innovation. And so what you see on this slide without me going through of that through them are some of the examples of great innovation and collaboration. Um, I'll highlight on the bottom left our virtual campus visits, which we realized that seniors in college weren't going to have the opportunity to visit campuses in some cases before they made a decision and where they were committing in the fall and partnered with BBYO and their virtual platform to be able to have each campus offer these virtual tours. It's one of the examples of being able to meet needs through collaboration and I have seen a lot more exciting collaboration happening across the Jewish world in this moment. Um, and, um, and, and hope and believe that will continue and that it's another one of the ways in which our partners can be incredibly supportive of our work. I'll stop sharing and um, pass back to you, Jim, to share with some Great. of our other thank panelists. You. Thank, thank you for that, uh, thank you for that kickoff. I think we'll go next to uh, Daniel. Daniel Cross, who uh, heads up the uh, partnership program at Birthright Israel. Thank you, Jim. It's wonderful to be here with my colleagues. Um, as everyone knows, uh, Birthright Israel's goal is to strengthen the Jewish people by building identity and connection through peer group educational experiences in Israel. Um, it's important perspective to keep in mind that the program operates in 68 countries. And the pandemic hit every sector, but it really um, impacted, of course, travel and social gatherings. And that really hit hard home for us because that's really at the very building blocks of how we shape our Israel experience. I have to mention that everything I'm saying today um, is rapidly changing and Taglid keeps daily watch and makes strategic decisions as situation unfolves. Um, and everything is really a snapshot in time. Um, Taglid, Taglid implemented um, major changes um, and really created three or four guiding principles which drove everything that they do. Firstly, ensuring the long-term sustainability and viability of Birthright Israel, safeguarding the interests of our funders, uh, maintaining Birthright Israel's human capital, and maintaining our key supplies and their ability to operate. And based on these principles, Birthright Israel management in consultation with its governing boards has taken every step to ensure that our recovery um, in the future. Um, like uh, my colleagues on this panel, the impact for college age and young adults um, has been great. And Jim touched on this, and I'm very proud that Birthright Israel 
has been involved with the group of Israel experience providers uh, that have been meeting since March uh, to work together as a network and to collaborate. Uh, the group is now merged uh, with the JFNA group and they're dealing with all these issues in a collaborative measure. And I think it's a, a wonderful sign of some of the um, things, silver linings that are evolving here. Elizabeth Silkowski, Executive Director of Birth of Israel North America, is representing Taglit and uh, we take this uh, involvement very seriously as we are the largest provider um, in this space. Um, the impact to us uh, impacted summer 2020, just a snapshot. Um, we initially had plans for April, May, June, July, about nine to nine and a half thousand, ten thousand participants each month. And now our projections for the year are down from original numbers of 45,000 to 12,550. Um, we need to make sure that we can have the resources uh, to be able to take the participants in the future. Our promise to them is to be able to ma make sure they can come as well as the future participants. But we are also been keeping very busy. And I want to focus just on a few of the opportunities that have um, arisen. And although there isn't um, trips on the ground, and you might wonder what exactly Birth for Israel has been doing, um, we have been focusing on, uh, in many different things, um, our alumni and how they have, as Mimi mentioned, wanted to help with service. Um, a few initiatives to share, um, Door to Door, which is an initiative of some alumni from Birthright Israel Excel, which is an entrepreneurship and leadership business program, part of Birthright Israel, and put out a call to action to the North American and Israel um, alumni to how they can face the challenges of what Corona is bringing, especially the elderly. And door to door is a play on uh, the Hebrew word, door to D-O-R, door, is a service for the elderly who are unable to leave their homes during the pandemic. And since it started, it's taken off and over 10,000 people have registered volunteers have been helped. And some other initiatives from this group feed the, the front line to help um, restaurants and uh, those in the front lines in the hospitals uh, receive food. Um, Teach It Forward, which is an opportunity for college students to help low income students who are in school from K to 12. So we're seeing there are so many different opportunities for alumni to be involved. Um, in terms of um, what we're doing with our core partners, which are the trip organizers, um, we have to ensure that we have um, the, the partners on the ground, many might not know, but our trip organizers are the backbone of how we facilitate and run our trips. And without travel industry, uh, they don't have uh, the volume from Birthright Israel and many other partners. So we made a decision to be able to support them and advance them some funds to the tune of $4 million to make sure that they can still uh, meet some of their means. And please God, when uh, we return to trips, we're also uh, looking at all the different options and Taglid Birthright Israel has struck a few different task forces to focus on the logistics of how social distancing will be able to implement it. So really running in different tandem um, lanes in terms of the logistics operating looking forward, how we can uh, sustain ourselves for the future and take the participants who didn't have the opportunity this summer and the others which will be registering thousands of participants and how we can use our leverage our global brand and our alumni to create opportunities, lots of virtual opportunities I could speak about as well. And I want to ensure, uh, as do my colleagues on this uh, Zoom, that everything will re resume in short order and that we continue as Birth or Israel and show to strengthen the vitality of the Jewish future. And we know as a people we're resilient and we have to look forward to the future together. And I turn back to you, Jim. Great, thank you. Um, next up is, uh, is uh, David Siegelman. David is the founder of Moisha and the CEO of Moisha House. Thanks, Jim. And as a plug, Jim's also the past board chair for Moisha House. So um, good to be with you and, and everyone else here, uh, including also Rebecca, who's a founding uh, resident of Moisha House in Philadelphia. And uh, Moisha House is all about inspiring Jewish homes. Uh, we focus on the post-college pre-family, 22 to 30 year old um, young Jewish adult population. And uh, we've been doing, getting up to 12,000 programs a year, um, serving 70,000 unique young adults throughout the world. There are um, over 120 Moisha houses spanning 28 countries. And um, the budget's about $14 million uh, globally now. And, and essentially everything that we were doing was in person, either they were gatherings at homes or they were gatherings for learning retreats or resident trainings. So um, this obviously, as with everyone, has had a huge impact. <clears throat> I wanna just touch on a couple challenges and then, and then some of these opportunities that I think have been uh, particularly exciting um, in this time. So Mimi touched on it and, and I think 
hit on it well, which is this uh, mental health situation. For young adults, there's basically um, two options, either staying and living in a really small, fairly uncomfortable apartment, usually in a place where they thought, well, I'm really here for the city, not the apartment. And, and now they, they only get the city or they only get the apartment side of it, or they move back home with their family. Both can be challenging um, in, in, in the long term when you're not planning for that. So um, we've partnered with Jewish Family Services. We provide, um, and, and Jewish Family Services have been wonderful in, in giving access to um, therapists and support through that network. Also with our own staff, um, we, the, our health insurance, if, if people haven't checked that they've dropped all deductibles for uh, mental health um, needs and wants on, uh, so there's phone numbers to, to call and um, people to, to engage with on Teladoc as well. And, and, and at least for our Aetna plan, they dropped all the deductibles and people have, have been very appreciative of that. Uh, another challenge has been just around the, the, the job uncertainty. And, and insecurity. So we've seen job loss, hours reduced, and just this overall fear of, of what's gonna happen in the future. So it's made committing to anything very difficult, where you're gonna be, what you're gonna do. And, um, and that's created a lot of anxiety for, 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 for young adults. The other thing that we've, we've seen at Moisha House is actually increased anti-Semitism. Um, we weren't a hub for it or a hotspot for, for anti-Semitism leading up to this, but there's two things that have happened. One is, um, like others, there's been Zoom bombing uh, situations where we were doing a Yom HaShoah program in, in um, France and Paris and, and had Zoom bomb come in and, and it would really rattle um, the group and we've seen that. The other is, um, well, I'll, I'll go into the program and, and, how, and, and, and what's happened with it. Moisha House um, has been running something called uh, camp nine and I Jewish summer camp for adults. And in our third year, we were expanding from two camps to three camps. We sold out um, both camps last year. And as, as we had to um, postpone or cancel camp nine and I for the East coast this year, we moved it over to something called expedition nine, a uh, global color war. And, and so we've had um, 250 plus teams sign up over 700 participants from 30 countries. Um, and, and the energy behind it has been fantastic. Um, someone asked in the Q&A piece about programs beyond feeling zoomed out. Well, we've, we've shifted, um, in addition to doing programming, we're also creating immersive uh, virtual experiences, which is different than a program. And so each week we have challenges and opportunities and people can go in and be with their teams and work on different projects together. On Facebook alone, there's been more than 100,000 um, interactions, and that's created a lot of anti-Semitism. We are now having daily uh, anti-Semitic attacks on um, on Facebook through the engagement because it's so much more open than in someone's home, and um, and that's something that's been been it is new to us as an organization um, that we're managing and dealing with. Um, as far as as far as opportunities. Um, one of the biggest that's been wonderful to see has been the, the increase in Jewish learning. People have more time now and, and being together and discussing things that matter uh, ha has been a really big positive thing. For our staff and our board, we provide support to do one-on-one -on -one Jewish learning with a teacher during, um, during work hours, whatever work hours are these days. But uh, we're seeing over 50% of our staff take that up um, regularly and about half of the board as well. Uh, we're now doing three Jewish learning or um, ritual activities a week for our staff just to just to be together and come in and they can be as quick as a as a candle lighting and lachayams for things that are grateful for on, on a Friday to um, to text learning and those are happening regularly including a Devar every week for the team and that's that's giving people not only a chance to be learners but also be teachers and and be together. Um, this, this notion and, and pivot to um, virtual experiences has been a great one too. I, I spoke about, um, about camp and we're seeing that in other places too, where uh, for example, we'll be doing uh, houses came together, four houses initially came together to, to think about how to do Shavuot. And now there are 30 houses around the world in five continents signed on to do 25 hours of Jewish learning for Shavuot. 
we would have never seen that um, before this. Everyone would have been thinking about their own city. So this whole global nature has, has been a wonderful piece of Moish House. We're having residents from every continent engage um, all, all over and actually come to each other's programs, which has been very cool. Um, and, and we've been able to also um, provide some insights into what's happening globally because there's Moisha houses in so many cities. So each Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, we run a program called Global Voices with Moisha House that features residents, uh, three to four residents from different cities talking about what, the, what it's like in their city Jewishly as a leader, and then as far as um, COVID-19 and what's opening and not, not opening. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll say here is that I, I actually think this is a big opportunity um, and, and a challenge, which is there's almost no outsourcing of Judaism right now. You, you can't go somewhere for your, for your Judaism. It exists in your home and, and that's where you are. And so we're seeing this, I've never seen this many people bake challahs on, on, on Fridays. I've never seen this many people share about their recipes and, and the rituals that they're doing with themselves, with their families, with their roommates. And, um, and, and I actually think that that's a huge, a huge gift that I hope we can take with us and say that actually we, we have a real responsibility um, and, 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 and seeing these young adults um, sort of embrace that and celebrate it in ways that I hadn't seen um, leading up to this is something that I hope we'll take with it post uh, COVID-19. Great. Thanks, David. And, and our, our uh, last but not least is uh, Rebecca Barr, who uh, comes to the, she's the executive director of Hala for Hunger. So. Thanks, Jim. And, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I, I want to echo a lot of what's been said already. Uh, Hall for Hunger serves campuses and communities around the country. Our core mission to provide opportunities for community, philanthropy, and advocacy all takes place in a single program, our challah bakes, and then the subsequent sales. Today, I really want to focus on the resilience of our students. So back in early March, our staff of six, uh, we called each of our chapter leaders from our 87 different college campuses to just listen to them. We wanted to know what they were hearing from our admin, their administration and what their plans were. And that led us to hosting a full community Zoom call to hear from campuses and community chapters, our alumni and anyone connected to the Hala for Hunger community. For us, we really choose intentionally to lead from behind. We prepare our students uh, with the tools and the resources they need to advocate for those most vulnerable on their campuses. Those are students who are food insecure. That number was already at 40% at four-year universities, and it grew overnight when campuses shut down, when they asked students to leave in a hurry, when they closed the dining halls. Students who were only able to eat because of their meal plan were now out of options. And our students got to work. Within a couple of weeks since campus closures, our students created or updated their food resource guides that they had on their campuses. They held virtual bakes. They made a lot of those challahs. Uh, they hosted fundraisers to stock the food pantries on their campuses and at their local food banks, and they wrote articles and op-eds about the difficult situations that students were in, and frankly, the dire situation that they're likely to go back to when they return to campus. We heard them and we pivoted. We continued our community Zoom calls throughout March and April. Students led calls on everything from communications for advocacy, using social media, alumni skill sharing, setting up a virtual giving circle, and others. In addition, we continued to run our spring campaign. It was originally slated as a Passover campaign, but we expanded our message to include COVID-19 and its effects on college students across the nation. Our goal, in addition to raising funds, was to raise awareness about the much needed advocacy efforts of our students when they return to campus about the CARES Act, the need to expand SNAP or food stamp benefits, and the national bills for hunger-free campuses. 
we shared stories of resilience on campus, our students leading efforts to work with administrators and local nonprofits, even in the midst of midterms and finals. The spring campaign culminated in a virtual challah bake. It was a celebration right after Passover. Like Hillel, we also heard about the huge loss of work-study jobs in the spring and the expected loss of jobs and internships this summer. For us, summer is a relatively quiet time, but not this year. We've spent the last few weeks planning for a national summer series of programming to launch an advocacy campaign in collaboration with a number of our partners, all through virtual sessions and other types of engagements, not just on Zoom, to reach our leaders who will have a lot more time this summer. Uh, while it might feel like a loss for our students, we know that our summer series will also serve as an opportunity for them to gain additional skills and tools to put into practice, affecting change in their home communities and within their campus administrations. As we continue to think toward the fall, it's important for us to acknowledge what's been lost. Proceeds from our bakes go equally to a local nonprofit like a food bank or a campus food pantry and our national philanthropic partner, Swipe Out Hunger. While we've doubled down on our advocacy and virtual community opportunities without those challah sales, direct service institutions that we normally serve are feeling our students' lack of philanthropy. Again, we go to our students through focus groups in reaching out to individuals, we're starting to explore models of virtual bakes and fundraisers that will allow us to have collective philanthropy as a continued part of our program. While we provide the tools and resources, our students continue to show us the way. Thanks, Jim. That's great. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, wow, really inspiring um, stories about uh, about big challenges. Um, so I, I, we'll, we'll turn to a, a few questions. I have a few questions and then we'll, we'll uh, open it up to, to folks in the chat room. So if you have questions, feel free to you know, post them. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about um, the, uh, so this, this has gone on now for several weeks. Um, are you getting, uh, are, are, we, are we starting to feel Zoom fatigue? Um, you know, are, are there people getting, uh, you know, young adults and students getting Zoomed out? Um, how, how, is, how is this sort of wearing on people? And I'll open it up, whoever wants to answer. I think you heard from all of us that absolutely there's already some <laughs> Zoom fatigue, and I'm sure, you know, all of us as panelists, and I'm sure everyone listening is also feeling that. Um, what's interesting is it's still the case that if you create a really powerful online experience, people are showing up. I think it, it's just requiring that the content and the experience is even richer in order for people to want to show up, or they're showing up to be with people they're in community with, rather than just to hear or see something. Um, the other thing I think it's requiring us to be really creative about and is a lot of fun is as we look, for example, towards this summer is finding other ways to virtually engage people that aren't on Zoom. Um, so we are going to spend a lot of our summer making sure that we create rich Jewish learning experiences. Like David was saying, people are interested in that for both our staff and our students. Um, we have a program called Dwell that we usually run as a one week summer camp uh, for Hillel professionals to give them Jewish knowledge and inspire them to do this with students. And we're moving it all online and finding ways to use podcasts, um, pair people up in Hevruta and take walks with their headphones on and just figuring out a lot of other experiential modalities because we know people are zoomed out and we need to find other ways to continue to engage them from a distance. And I just echo what Mimi said um, I'm very proud of the agility of the marketing of Taglit Bertha Israel. And while Zoom is great for smaller settings like this, um, a lot of our audience and the younger 
um, future audience and current alumni are still using uh, Instagram and still using Facebook. And we've had tremendous uh, metrics on some of our campaigns. Uh, we had a uh, We're Waiting For You campaign um, on Facebook and Instagram that had a million impressions and 500,000 unique plays, um, very innovative um, programming uh, virtually. Uh, we had a set of live uh, for people to come together for um, Passover, and that also had thousands of impressions. And we're waiting for you. Uh, also, a very popular campaign. So we're looking at Instagram for not as deep engagement as an hour-long Zoom, but certainly being able to give people content and traveling. And we're exploring virtual tours to go to city by city in Israel and be on the beach and be in Svat in northern Israel, given that it's like Baomer today, or be uh, at the Kotel. And you can have well-produced three to four minute videos that still give people a taste and a flavor, but being not, not, not causing the Zoom fatigue and causing them uh, to sort of dial and switch off everything. Mm -hmm. What about, what about the, um, the platforms that you, you I mean, we, we're all sort of using Zoom as kind of a, you know, virtual platform, but Mimi, you mentioned earlier, um, uh, I think it was Hillel at Home. Is that a platform that had already existed um, that, or is that something that you guys created on the fly? What's, what, how, how's it? I, I hear things about, I've, I've heard things about the BBYO plat. Somebody mentioned the BBYO platform. I think maybe you did. And, and I've heard that's, that had been around for a while and they're repurposing it to a much greater degree now. But I'm curious about sort of what platforms people are using or using. The Hillel at Home, so there was, there was no Hillel at Home before this crisis. Um, the story is uh, a Hillel director called me um, in the early days of campuses shutting down and canceling spring breaks and said, we're not taking people on alternative spring breaks this year, and it's very likely our classes are going to be online after spring break, and what if Hillel International were to take some of the load from local campuses and do some of the things that maybe um, campuses can't do or won't be able to pivot to in this moment when we have so much on our plates um, and we're to have some of the you know major speakers or we're to aggregate some of our learning opportunities from local Hillel's and so within six days um, a team you know put up a very basic landing page that's all Hillel at home is and it's grown from there um, and started talking to campuses about who the speakers were that were coming and what the, um, who the educators were on campus um, and put it all on a landing page and got it going. Uh, when we had our first meeting and we're gonna launch, I said, let's try and get two or three things that are really solid and just get this live. By the time it launched six days later, there were like 12 programs and we just hit the 100 program mark. There's everything from, you know, work out with your local, you know, Hillel director to our student leadership cabinet running, you know, weekly Havdalas to we just had Brene Brown um, on the platform talking to students in conversation. Um, and that's all come up since that crisis. But I will say this is one of those um, ways in which we've made, you know, uh, lemonade out of lemons, because I think a lot of it will be able to live on certainly during this next year if campuses are in a situation that's less than stable, but maybe even beyond that, where there are some campuses that don't have the resources or without formal staff where it's beneficial to have the national platform. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, um, I know David and I had talked earlier in the week about Moisha House and, the, and sort of the balance between, um, you know, local programming and, uh, you know, that, 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 that was, you know, the Moish House model is about the, the, the residents of the house putting on the programming for their network of friends and people come to their network. Um, to the extent to which the national organization gets more involved or the international organization gets more involved in trying, you know, to, to drive a platform or, or something, do you get into some challenges trying to figure out, you know, do you, are you taking away from, from the residents you know, actually doing the programming and, and sort of how do you get that balance? Maybe David, you could talk a little bit about it. But, yeah, I think the, the, the biggest thing is the difference between sort of uh, forcing something and, um, and providing opportunities. So, so for example, Moisha houses were, are averaging seven, each house, seven programs a month. And when we were in, in person and beginning in, in May, we've shifted that to, um, to each house, doing three programs a month because they're virtual and you don't want to hit that that sort of zoomed out um, situation but in addition to those three programs every resident is 
um, expected and, and encouraged to participate in two other things happening. And that, that involves going to someone else's programs or participating in Expedition Nye or coming to one of the programs that Moisha House International is, is putting on. And almost always when we're putting on programs, uh, there's a sort of a team of, of young adults, residents who are uh, leading the way, um, leading the way with that. So um, yeah, it's, it, 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 we, we've seen a lot of appreciation from, from the houses and the, and the residents in, in that, and it's been a positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, uh, do, you, do you want to, I'm sorry, do you want to jump oh, in? Yeah. No, I was going to comment on that, that I think uh -huh. that as organizations, if we're able to provide the container uh, in a lot of these ways, but give our, our students uh, or young adults the opportunities to say how they want to lead, we've we've certainly seen that at Hall for Hunger. Uh, everything that we've come up with has been by something that a student or a participant has said to us. And and then, you know, you're zoomed out, what would you like to do instead? Oh, you'd like to run an Instagram live? That sounds a lot more complicated than sitting in front of a screen. Go right ahead. We'll give you the space, we'll help you with the graphics, we'll do that for you. And and providing that balance of things that we're putting out as an organization and things that we're participating in that the, that the students are doing. I think, you know, just echoing both Hillel and, and Moisha House doing that as well. Daniel, you, talk, you, you raised an interesting point about um, your providers, your trip providers, um, and, the, and the challenge, I, I guess I'm wondering about the challenges of, of uh, that you're facing with um, trying to keep them basically in business, right? Yeah, I mean, these, right. these are folks who you rely on to do this and, and they're going to have, you know, it's an earned revenue business. They're, they're, they've got a hole now in their calendar that they can't ever recover, uh, you know, and, and so can you talk a little bit more about sort of what that means to the, to the model? Right, so we have the, uh, the, the lens of history in many ways, because when the, um, Intifada happened in 99, 2000. Uh, there were some uh, changes that happened. There were many more trip organizers in those days. Um, and there's no real way to equate uh, the Intifada and what's happening now. Um, but it didn't impact the, both their ability to recruit. They're not just operators on the ground. We've invested a tremendous amount of resource, both to the tour operators and the tour educators to really uh, deepen their ability to connect with our audience. Um, and we need to find every which way we can to retain the, um, our capacity uh, to give them uh, you know, business in the future. So outside of the financial um, uh, outlays that we've given them, and I mentioned close to $4 million, we're trying how we can figure out opportunities virtually to use them uh, to bring either alumni or future participants to taste a little bit of uh, what a tour might look like. Uh, we also know that we're going to have significant increased costs uh, because of social distancing. The estimate at the moment is about $1,000 per participant of added cost uh, to, uh, to qualify, to, sorry, to make sure we comply with all of the uh, qualifications uh, because of social distancing. So all that taken into account, we're doing whatever we can to retain um, them as core partners so that we can go back and go back and, go and resume trips as strongly as possible. Mm -hmm. So to all of you, I guess maybe um, we're talking about partnerships. Are, have you learned new things about partnering with other folks, uh, you know, other organizations as a result of this? Um, Rebecca, you mentioned, you know, partners, you know, that you've been working a lot with partners. Um, what, 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 what's new about with partnerships and in, in the work that you're doing? I think there's uh, a lot of opportunity for partnership because people are really banding together because everything is online. So for us, where we had one campus focusing on a, a particular campaign with their college administrators, we're now able to bring multiple schools together and use a campus in you know, Middlebury College, for example, can advise Muhlenberg on how to get in touch with their, their college president. And they might have met at an in-person annual gathering before, and now they're meeting weekly online. In the same way, we work together with a number of other student uh, food insecurity groups. I mentioned Swipe Out Hunger as one of our national partners, but also the Hope Center 
uh, on food insecurity and an organization called RISE. So we all work together to uh, put a toolkit together to help our students figure out how to advocate for the CARES Act uh, money, uh, if you're not familiar, m money that's going to uh, schools and universities when students go back to campus to advise their administrators on how those funds could be dispersed to help those most vulnerable. So working together to form that kind of coalition to put a toolkit together amplifies the voices of all of our organizations. And I have found nothing but willing uh, collaborators for those partnerships. People want to work together to reach more people and, and figure out the, the best ways to do that. Any other examples of, of particular, particularly interesting partnering that's happening that maybe you wouldn't have thought of before this? Yeah, I can, I can touch on one that um, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't have thought of before. Another organization brought to us um, a program called Burn Along, which is um, a subscription and you can sign up um, and go ahead and, and, and they have workshops. They can be um, workouts, they can be meditation, um, all sorts of different programs, like hundreds and hundreds of programs that you can do. And, and, it's, and it was built for um, people who work from home, right? I'd never heard of it. I'd never worked from home. We looked at it and they were able to work out um, between three organizations, $6 a year membership um, per person. So we, we made it available to every Moisha House resident in the world and our staff uh, as a way of saying, look, we know your life has adjusted right now and we want to adjust with it and, and provide sort of these types of opportunities to make it more habitable uh, to, to engage in, 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 this, in this new world. And so um, we've, we've certainly had partnerships with lots of like, Jewish organizations and such, but it's also outside the Jewish world because everyone's sort of in this same place together, which has been really, I think, um, uh, uh, nice to see. And I think just to echo what Rebecca said, um, not necessarily highlighting one particular partnership, but we partner with uh, dozens of organizations. But what's beautiful to see is some of the hurdles that sometimes stand in between partnerships um, have simply been eradicated by everyone's willingness to sort of deliver something together as quickly um, as possible. And the red tape that sometimes stands in, in, in front of everyone it has been obliterated. Um, we, Hillel is one of our strongest um, campus providers. And we know rather than replicate, which we've taken the approach for many things we're doing, um, some of our um, educators and staff are speaking on their Hillel platform. And I also want to amplify the, um, the collaboration that has been happening on the Israel engagement um, service providers, that we're really partnering together to approach uh, the current realities and also how we go back to Israel and be on the ground in the future as one entity to make sure that we're all operating under the same protocols and scenarios and I think that's very important and that's a beautiful collaboration that might have existed uh, in silos but certainly now is happening in a much more cohesive fashion. Yeah I just want to say one thing about this from a funding perspective that's interesting right because I know for Hillel International, I was sort of describing, we also sometimes play a funding role. And it's really powerful to feel like you can give um, to one project that can, for us, you know, impact multiple campuses around an issue. So we have all of the SUNY schools, for example, right now are collaborating with UJA and supporting students who are, um, who are facing food insecurity and housing insecurity in this crisis. And to be able to give to those Hillels, that are working on an important issue and working collectively with a partner really just feels like it can amplify your impact. So I think from a funder perspective, all of the openness towards collaboration because we all recognize that we are seeing the same issues and working towards the same causes um, is really powerful. And Jim, Jim, I'm sorry, I just want to chime in on one other thing that I think is pertinent to this group as you know, Jewish Funders Network is that I do think having more resources for organizations to explore mergers and acquisition is going to be really important this during this time. Not necessarily to do it, but to be able to have the facilitated conversation and expertise to know what we would be saying yes or no to, because that is something that on the ground we're seeing, but I don't think we're really prepared to understand how to have those conversations in a way um, 
that isn't saying like a yes or a no from the beginning, but rather how to explore that. Uh, and I, I think that'll be more and more of a reality that'll have to happen. And if we could have sort of the ability to have an educated, facilitated conversation around it, it would be quite helpful. Great. Got maybe time for one more quick. Um, and thank you. I want to thank all the folks who have um, sent in questions. I've been trying to grab them off the chat as we as we went along. Uh, and I got some of them, but not all of them. But thank you for those. Any other things, uh, any other points that, that any of you as panelists want to share with the funders? Um, you know, David, David just had a good one. Any, any other points that you want to, you think the funders ought to be aware of um, before we take our leave? All right. Well, that's we've we've certainly spent we've certainly shared a lot of uh, of ideas. So uh, I think there's lots to uh, to for uh, for everyone to uh, take away from our our, our uh, situation here. Um, okay. I think what I'm going to do, given it's 11:26, is uh, turn it back to to Mark for a quick wrap up. And thank you all for joining us. I am actually going to take your closing. Sorry. Okay. Great. Um, but I want to thank all of you for this very critical conversation, and um, I hope you've all gathered that there are tens of thousands of people in this age group who are being impacted, and this is just a, a sampling of the number of organizations that are are serving that community of young adults and college age students. Um, so it, it's really important that we continue these conversations and continue to think about and invest in supporting our young adults and college students. Um, I know that we not, as Jim said, we were not able to get to all of the questions. Um, I've put information uh, about each of the organizations in the chat, so feel free to reach out individually or collectively to our panelists um, from today. And uh, again, I want to mention that JFN does have, in addition to um, events, a, a resource hub, and I put the link in the website. So this is open, it is available to the community, and it's a way that we can provide support and a central place for information about how our community is responding to this crisis. And the, as I think David really articulated, the opportunities, and all of you did. Um, that we have to redefine our boundaries of geography and time um, that are often constraints to programming. And so again, thank you all so much. And Jim, you did a great job. Thank you for your facilitation. And um, that's it. So we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.